reverse the setting, what we want to do is solve the equation f of x equals 0. Okay. And to do that, uh, we'll use a, a number of a numerical techniques. Uh, um, the first of them is going to be the bisection method. Let's agree to call a solution of this equation here a root. A number for which the function is 0 is called a 0. Zeros and roots are more or less the same numbers, but one refers to the solution of an equation. Okay, uh, so x equals 2 is a solution of x squared minus 4 equals 0. Now, we're looking for numerical solutions, which means we will almost never find a value x for which the function is exactly 0. So we need a criteria for when we're going to agree to have found a 0 or an approximate 0 of a function. And we will always select, uh, almost always select, a small number epsilon and declare that if the function at some value a is less than epsilon, we'll call that an approximate root. The value uh, of epsilon is called a tolerance. Okay, so here's the procedure that we'll be following. Um, we're going to be generating uh, a sequence of values which will be called iterates. That'd be either x0, x1, x2, x3, and so on, or x1, x2, x3, and so on. And uh, in this particular example, you can see the iterates. Uh, here's the function, and here's the iterate x1, x2, x3, x4. And what we'll do is agree to stop the iteration if uh, the uh, n plus first iterate is within epsilon of the root. Now the problem that we have here is that we don't know the root. So this direct comparison here, this direct comparison that we're looking at, simply is not going to uh, allow us to make any realistic computations. So we have to think of something more indirect than that. For the bisection method, what we're going to be able to prove is that there's a sequence of numbers such that the distance of the n plus first iterate to the, to the actual root is smaller than that um, error, let's call it, uh, factor times the distance of the nth iterate to the root. So what we can do then is then uh, use this in a compounded way to measure the accumulated distance to the root from the starting point. And we will have an approximation of how close we are to the root from the starting point in the bisection method. To complete uh, what, what I was just saying, let's suppose all those e sub n's are the same number m. Then applying this repeatedly, we have that x1 minus a is less than m times x0 minus a. And of course, I'm implying absolute values around those differences. And then x2 minus a is less than m times x1 minus a, but that's then less than m squared. And generally, and so forth, we'll have xn plus 1 minus a is less than m uh, to the n plus 1 x naught minus a. So what you can see here is that if we have some good control on m, like m is less than 1 or even a half, we will be able to actually predict how close we are to the root if we only know how an estimate of how close we are at the onset of the process. And that's the idea of the bisection method, and m will be about 1 half. So let's take a look at the bisection method. And the fundamental premise is that we begin with uh, two values, two starting values, such that the product of the functions at the two values is negative. And simply this means that f of x0 and f of x1 have different signs. That means 
uh, assuming continuity of the function, that there is a zero of the function between x0 and x1. And so we know that x0 minus a will be equal to or less than x0 minus x1 because we have squeezed it in between. So here's the idea. The idea is to take those two values, we'll call one the left and one the right, because one will be on the left and the other will be on the right, and take their average, and that will be our next iterate. And we'll know that we're approximately half again closer than we used to be. Now in this particular method, we have to make a decision, and that is uh, we have to uh, 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 take the one of the previous values so that uh, the product is negative. So when we get x2, that's going to be one a new value, but f of x2 is either going to be positive or negative. And so what we want to do is pair it with the other one that is negative or positive, respectively. Okay? And that's the whole idea of the method. Uh, we then compute x3 to be xl plus xr. Now remember, xl or xr is x2, and xl or xr is one of x0 and x1. Okay? Now think about it for a while. It, it might seem a little confusing for me to say it, but in fact, it, that when you compute the next iterate, you have to make sure that you still have the sign change of the function so that you have trapped the zero or the root it between the two numbers. Okay, and here's an example. We're just going to find uh, use the bisection method to find the zero of a, of a quadratic, which you certainly well can find anyway. And we know the solutions a bit are 2 and 1. And what I'm going to use are starting values 1.5 and 3. So I know that the, uh, that the, that the 0 of the quadratic, is, uh, which is at 2, is in between. OK, so what you can see now is um, the computation being made. Uh, I first compute the signs, and then and note the product is negative, and then I set XL to be one and XR to be the other, right here. Then I compute X2, which is the average, and the value of X2. It's positive, so I'm going to be comparing that up with F of 1.5. So 2.25 and 1.5 will be my next two starting values to compute the next average which is 1.875. And you know, well, now we're going to have a negative value for the function. So I will be pairing the 1.875 with the 2.25 and taking the average to get the next value. Now here is the error uh, development for the bisection method. And it is exactly like we described earlier. We know that each time up, we're half again closer because we've divided uh, by a half, and then we just chase those halves from hither to yon, you might say, and then the halves become halves to powers, as we did in general with m. All right, so we continue that up, and we finally want to get uh, xn plus 1 minus a less than epsilon 1. And to do that, we'll solve uh, 4n, the equation 1 over 2 to the n times x1 minus x0 equals epsilon 1. And you can actually compute that, uh, solve for n, and that will give you the number of iterations you have to take. So in the bisection method, you can actually define beforehand the number of iterations that you have to make and just make them rather than doing any testing after each iteration. Uh, in, in this example here, uh, for the same function and the same starting values, we compute that it would take uh, 14 iterations to achieve a tolerance of 10 to the minus fourth in our answer. The bisection method gets us closer by one half each time. But as we'll see, that isn't as fast as we need. However, the bisection method is the most reliable method there is, because once you have found two values for which 
the sign changes, you know the zero is in between, and you can just hone in on it by making these divisions by one half. Now what you can see here is um, a uh, what we call pseudocode right here. Pseudocode and uh, it describes uh, in non uh, specific language the logic that's involved in doing the bisection method. Okay? And it's pretty straightforward. It merely codifies what I just said a few moments ago about the bisection method and how to work it in a specific example. Uh, to compute starting values for the bisection method, then what do we need to do? We need to search the real line until we find two values which have a different sign. And that is uh, one pretty powerful weakness of the whole system is that the search can take a long time unless you have some a priori knowledge of where the root might be. Uh, if you, uh, you can certainly take, uh, search every point basically and then step by some increment uh, and if you make the step too small you can be searching for quite a long time. If you make it too large you might just jump across where the function is actually zero. So there's a certain amount of art involved in making these determinations of finding starting values for the bisection method. The regular falsy method is uh, bisection-like because it still uses two values that have different of the two values for which the function has a different sign, but instead of simply blindly bisecting to get our next value, we actually interpolate and I think with a straight line and then take where the line crosses the axis. Let's take a look at how that uh, looks. Here's the regular falsy method. We have our x0 and x1 where the sign is different. And then, instead of just taking the bisector between x0 and x1, we take the straight line that joins the point at x1, f of x1, x0, f of x0, and where it crosses the axis, that's going to become x2. And then we do the same thing to get x3. We're now using x2 and x1. We have to make the decision again to make sure we have the two points where the sign changes of the function. And as you can see here, the regular falsy method uh, does tend to converge faster uh, because as you get closer and closer to the root, what happens is uh, that the function uh, appears to be straighter and straighter and hence uh, it's likely, likely following a line. However, in this particular example, it was made up to show that what can happen is that the iterates from the regular falsy method that has come from these intersections of these lines here can actually converge slower if you have a weirdly behaving looking function. I think I could show you another example, uh, but I'll postpone it for, uh, for another time. Uh, I suggest you draw up a couple of examples, one where the function's kind of straight and one where the function really dips down. Consider the function, uh, for example, x to the tenth power minus uh, 0.5, or minus, uh, say, uh, 0 0.01, all right? And take your two starting values to be a 0 and 1. Then you'll see that the, the function actually crosses the axis very close to 0, or close to 1, rather, but you'll be stepping along quite slowly uh, because the function is almost squared off. X to the tenth is has a has a horseshoe shape, but it's almost squared off. <laughs>